Hello and welcome back. This is the week nine lecture. So today we're talking about Go Fish, directed by Rose Troche. This is another part of the new queer cinema of the early 90s. We've already talked a little bit about that movement, so we can certainly categorize this film along with some of the other films that, a couple of the other films that we've already seen this semester, but it's obviously different in a lot of ways. I think it's interesting for us because Troche is very influenced by Spike Lee uh, and some of his early work, so we might be able to see some of those influences, particularly when it comes to the visuals of this particular film, but we can also compare it to Parting Glances and perhaps My Own Private Idaho as well, because those films often would be categorized as part of this larger movement that we've been talking about. It sort of starts in earnest in the 80s, but it becomes a little bit more visible uh, and well-known in the 90s, this idea of the new queer cinema, new kinds of representation, different kinds of gay characters compared to what we had seen previously in earlier periods of cinematic history. So we can put this film within that framework, but I think it's doing some different things and we can obviously do a lot of different things with it. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the production side, the business side with this film, uh, both because it falls within these sort of general uh, parameters and contours that we've been talking about with a lot of our other films, but also Pearson, once again, if we're keeping up with our readings, uh, Pearson, once again, is directly involved in this particular film. So I wanted you guys to read the chapter entitled Go Fiscal, Anatomy of a Back End. This is where Pearson sort of walks us through in sometimes excruciating detail uh, all of the ins and outs of the uh, distribution deal that gets signed here. He's a part of one of the companies that helps to get Go Fish made. They're, they're able to contribute money uh, towards the production of the film. So uh, Pearson kind of seems like he has some scores to settle in the chapter. And I, I'm not as interested in all of the the business arrangements, but I am interested in the larger argument that he's making in the chapter, and it's really a response to an accusation that was made by another filmmaker, but a belief that Troche, uh, Troche seems to also uh, possess this idea that maybe she didn't get her fair share of the proceeds from the film, but it's sort of a larger argument that we're going to get into that Pearson mentions in the chapter, uh, this idea that a lot of indie filmmakers are sort of exploited or taken advantage of when they do business uh, with you know bigger studios or bigger companies, whether they be production companies or distribution companies. This idea that the creative forces, the directors, <laughs> maybe the writers, uh, don't get their fair share. And it's the suits, it's the people running the studios, running the production and distribution companies that are really profiting <laughs> off of these movies. And that accusation seems to really sting Pearson. He seems to take it very personally. So if you read that chapter, he's largely refuting the idea that he ripped off Troche and did not give her sort of her fair share of the earnings. He makes an interesting sort of larger point about just how the business works. Um, also some points about this movie in particular, but I think it's worth examining a little bit more in a little bit more detail because we have been talking about the business side at least a little bit for most of these films. But also just a quick reminder about our schedule before we get into the movie, I misspoke a little bit back in the week eight lecture. I'm not sure if I've acknowledged or addressed this in any way, but I got a little bit confused about our schedule. So I was telling you guys that unit two uh, was winding down and we were getting ready for our final unit, which is going to sort of be largely about Miramax and a lot of films that they were involved in uh, between the mid to late 90s. And I mistakenly said that that unit was going to start uh, in week nine with Go Fish. But according to my syllabus, that is not true. Uh, week nine is the final week of 
of Unit 2. So we have moved to the year 1994, which is another sort of landmark kind of watershed year, I guess, for uh, the types of indie films that we're watching because several noteworthy movies come out in 94. We're going to see, I think, maybe three or at least two that are uh, from that same year. So I got a little mixed up because of the dates. I thought we were already moving into Unit 3, but Go Fish uh, concludes Unit 2, and Unit 3 will begin in Week 10 with Pulp Fiction, directed by Quentin Tarantino, which also came out in 94. So (laughs) kind of an arbitrary dividing line between these films. Uh, We're not strictly going by, uh, you know, chronology time. We're also sort of looking at themes and larger movements. So we're going to shift into our final unit next week. So that means your second critical uh, response paper will be due at the end of this week and you guys can write on any of the films that we've watched so far in unit two. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit about what Pearson's getting into in the chapter. I don't want to rehash it, and I don't care that much about all of the numbers and all of the contracts and all of that stuff. Um, But I, I, I am a little bit intrigued in how the movie gets made. Because, again, Pearson wants to make some larger points about sort of the indie film business. And he's using this film to kind of illustrate some of those points. So as he mentions in the chapter, uh, he sees an unfinished sort of early version of the film. Uh, He becomes intrigued and ultimately he gets involved in financing it. So uh, the film during the production stage, uh, basically it gets produced through this joint effort (laughs) really between multiple entities. So let's run through all the different companies involved, starting with an independent uh, production company known as Kalen uh, Vashon, Kalen Vashon Productions. Now, Vashon is the last name of Christine Vashon, who was a pretty well known independent film producer uh, throughout this period in the 90s up into, up into the early. 2000s and later later in the 90s i think she would uh go on to create a new company known as killer films and they would produce a number of pretty successful indie films that we are not watching uh but some movies that came out later in the 90s like i shot andy warhol and uh, Velvet Goldmine. So uh, they kind of made a name for themselves as a production company that sort of specialized in independent, uh, sort of more art, arty uh, type films. Uh, but before she did that, she was involved with Kalen Vashon Productions and they were helping to finance, they were helping to produce Go Fish. So we have that company to start with. And then we have Islet, another company that Pearson mentions. This is his company. So Islet is the indie division of a larger production company known as Island Pictures. So we've been talking about this throughout the semester. These big studios or these big production companies or even in some cases distribution companies and in other cases they would do both. They would have branches or divisions, smaller offshoots that would specialize in art films, indie films, um, you know, stuff that might have been considered more niche, a smaller market, smaller films, lower budgets, but they would be involved in either getting those movies produced or buying those movies after they had already been produced and distributing them. Uh, both for theaters and, of course, the huge home video market that we've also been tracking a little bit. Now we're in the 90s, so home video is not new like it was in the 80s. Now it's kind of just a standard feature of American movie going. So keep that in mind. Okay, so Islet is the indie division of a larger company. And Pearson, again, work, I mean, it is, it's his baby. It's his deal. And as he points out in the chapter, they call it Islet because it's small. 
it's even smaller than an island uh, and the films that he's working with are small but he's helping to finance right they are on the production side here so they're finding movies that need more money like Go Fish. Oftentimes the production would have already started. There would have already been some financial backing, but often not enough to finish the film or not enough for post-production. You know, the whole editing process, which happens after shooting. So Pearson's group, they would step in uh, to provide more financing in certain cases like here uh, and help bring the film to completion. So Islet's involved, but also we have Can I Watch Pictures, <laughs> which is another company, in this case the company founded by Troche and uh, Guinevere Turner, who plays Max in the film. Uh, and the two of them were partners at the time. Turner uh, is probably the most recognizable uh certainly the most recognizable cast member here. She would go on to have a pretty long career as both an actor and writer. Kind of an interesting career. We'll talk more about Turner. But uh, So they founded that company, th th their own company, their own production company, Can I Watch Pictures? Um, but it was relatively small, and they didn't have a whole lot of money. But they were one of the sources. They were providing some of the of the budget but they were also getting help from islet and from uh uh kaylin vachon productions so there's three companies involved here in the financing and production of the film so uh the film ends up playing at the sundance film festival which a lot of you are probably familiar with uh big film festival in Utah founded by Robert Redford I think originally a lot of big indie films play there and it was actually bought there by Metro Goldwyn Mayer big studio uh, they buy the film and then would later distribute the film um, so that's the kind of success story <laughs> that Pearson celebrates in other chapters. The whole process of getting an indie film, selling an indie film to a major distribution company. Pearson does that in other chapters. He does that with other films. And he does it here, <laughs> but instead of sort of, or he at least helps, he participates in that process. But instead of celebrating it as a victory, here he's more interested in sort of litigating exactly how the deal went down and who got paid what and again he gets really deeply into the weeds particularly with that whole distribution deal um, with Metro Goldwyn Mayer so we don't we don't have to worry too much about that but it is interesting to think about once again a, a relatively small indie film shot on a shoestring budget um, getting purchased uh, by the distribution arm of a major studio, but it's, it's interesting to know, and Pearson talks about this, the film maybe didn't get marketed really well. It got a theatrical release, but uh, after a pretty promising initial box office return, the film kind of faded in theaters. And also interesting to note that it didn't have a really vigorous home video rollout. And Pearson talks about that later in the chapter as well. So he places some blame. He acknowledges that the film maybe should have made a little bit more money. Uh, and he talks about some of the reasons that it didn't. And it doesn't have anything to do with the quality of the film, but rather the way the film, again, was marketed, was, was shown, uh, the, the way it was exhibited, <laughs> that final stage of uh, the whole film process. So, you know, we can talk about some of that stuff too. And again, the search for a market. You know, he kind of talks about this with some of the other films, talked about it with My Own Private Idaho. Um, some studio executives still a little bit skeptical about films representing what would have been viewed as like alternative lifestyles, underrepresented groups. These films were thought of as being very niche. They could only appeal to a relatively small audience. Uh, they weren't expected to perform the same way as other films. So that's obviously playing a role as well. So, you know, just some stuff to keep in the background and we'll kind of come back to Pearson a little bit as we go. But yeah, just to kind of go over the basics, uh, Rose 
Tro uh, Troche is our director. She also co-wrote the screenplay with Guinevere Turner. Um, so they co-wrote co-write the screenplay. Turner plays the lead role, I would say, as well. The film comes out in 94, makes a splash at Sundance. Pearson claims that it exceeded his artistic expectations. <laughs> and he also claims that the film has a certain visual uh, panache, a, 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 a certain uh, quality, uh, you know, a flair um, that's very appealing. And he, he seems a little surprised. Again, he, he points out early in the chapter um, that he he could tell it was going to make a big splash with what he calls sort of, you know, the lesbian audience, but he seems almost surprised at the artistic achievements of the film and the fact that it might have a little bit more to offer beyond just this kind of niche appeal. So we can sort of talk about Pearson's slightly patronizing tone, the way he talks about Troche and the film as a whole. Also, but we can also talk about some of that visual flair that he's discussing. We we'll, we'll notice the black and white photography, obviously. We'll also notice we should notice a lot of camera movement. Uh, we have a lot of pans, a lot of different angles. We have some pretty dramatic close-ups, and also what we might refer to as sort of like artistic interludes, <laughs> these sort of breaks in the action, often they're, they're transitions between scenes where we'll get, um, you know, sort of various poetic imagery or, you know, uh, close-ups of, of bodies. We get sort of non-narrative elements, we might say. We sort of step outside the world of the narrative for these little interludes. Uh, some reviewers referred to them as, you know, arty montages. You know, there were different terms used. But as we're watching, we should notice those. Also, a kind of poetic voiceover uh, supplied by... Uh, the Max character. So we have a lot of interesting components that go along with a pretty realistic uh, sort of look at, you know, life for these characters, a little similar perhaps uh, to what we saw with, with Parting Glances, just a sort of group of lesbian characters who are very comfortable uh, with their sexual and sort of gender identity. They're existing in a world that um, is not made to seem strange or drastically different um, from what film goers had probably seen before. Uh, so um, sort of normalizing uh, gay characters in a way that I think we've talked about a little bit. Uh, Characters who are pretty well adjusted, uh, pretty unapologetic portrayal, very frank, uh, sort of a celebration in some ways. Some reviewers saw it that way, at least. When, when the film came out, it was sometimes discussed as a, a sort of an upbeat exploration of a lifestyle or a way of life that a lot of Americans had not seen portrayed on screen very much. And that's something that they tackle uh, in the film. In the opening, we sort of have this almost academic opening, uh, and we have this idea introduced very early on that for much of our history, lesbians have been sort of invisible, at least in a lot of art and a lot of cultural productions. Um, but we've already kind of talked about that, how, you know, throughout uh, cinematic history, gay characters, you know, they've been present, but they've often been sort of hidden. They've been subtext. They haven't been uh, dealt with sort of clearly, directly, above board. Um, and uh, that's beginning to change over the course of the 80s and the 90s. So there's a lot to talk about in terms of the visuals, just in terms of the way the movie is put together. We have this sort of Greek chorus, <laughs> another almost like extra element that's added on to an otherwise sort of realistic sort of slice of life love story. We might think of it largely as a love story uh, between Max and Eli, but... Uh, 
we can also think of it sort of within the context of some of these other films that we've seen because Pearson mentions in the chapter that Troche was sort of inspired by Spike Lee and Lee's early career, some of Lee's early films. Um, and she kind of wanted to emulate Spike Lee. But again, coming back to the money, coming back to the business side, what, what Pearson wants to point out um, and, and Troche is sort of, you know, looked at as an up and coming director after this film. Um, uh, but he says, you know, Lee was really able to sort of make it after She's Gotta Have It, his breakthrough, you know, his breakthrough film in 86. Because if you remember, Lee owned his own production company. Uh, so he owned, according to Pearson, two thirds of his own film. Um, he didn't need a lot of help from outside companies to finish the production stage. So according to Pearson, Lee had a lot more equity. And this allowed Lee to have, apparently, just a little bit more control over the process of that film being uh, distributed, uh, exhibited, etc. So he got a larger cut of the money, I guess. Uh, Pearson doesn't spend a lot of time on the point, but he just mentions that, you know, uh, Troche and, and Turner, they have to rely on outside sources. So apparently they don't have enough equity. And also, as he points out, maybe a little bit gratuitously, uh, that she's got to have it uh, gross like three times as much at the box office as go fish so he's kind of in service of his larger point which is the distribution deal was fair the movie was good um it should have made more money he mentioned some of the reasons it doesn't he also mentions that the cost of distribution is always going to be high but then he lands kind of ultimately on this point that trochi uh troche just did not have uh, the equity or didn't have the control necessary. And that seems to be largely a matter of finances. It doesn't really seem to have anything to do with artistic vision or achievement. So just something to keep in mind. But again, I want us to think about how she might have been influenced a little bit by, by Spike Lee, particularly if we're thinking about visuals. We have a very active camera here moving around a lot. Not exactly what we see in Do the Right Thing, but we might be able to find some visual similarities. Um, so the movie ultimately grosses a little bit over two million, which isn't bad considering that it was made uh, on the cheap, uh, but not a huge success, not on par with some of the other things we've seen, but it generated a lot of positive reviews. <laughs> I'm going to post a few film reviews uh, from 94 so you guys can get a little bit of a feeling for its reception. I think some of the reviews have probably aged a little badly. I don't know. You guys can be the judge. I think some of the language that was used to describe the film and describe the characters um, <laughs> it would probably not be used today. Uh, but we do have to keep in mind that, you know, it was quite a while ago. Um, our vocabulary was a little different. Certain cultural norms were a little bit different, perhaps. But a lot of reviewers sort of responded favorably to what was largely perceived as sort of an upbeat sort of tone. I don't know if you guys would agree with that. Uh, again, the, the unapologetic portrayal of lesbian characters. But there are issues of identity that get brought up that I think are interesting. But just a few uh, little uh, tidbits from critics, some phrases and terms used by them at the time. Uh, high spirits uh, when describing the film. High spirits, uh, upbeat, laughs, wit, uh, candor. Um, <laughs> and the somewhat odd use of the phrase Girls just want to have fun. Uh, one reviewer literally used that phrase to sort of describe the overall tone or mood of the film or perhaps to describe the characters. I don't know. I think that's fair, I guess, to an extent. I think there's probably a little bit more going on with these characters beyond just having fun. But uh, I guess it is fun. 
Uh, there is fun to be had. Um, some people sort of identified the film, a lot of people, a lot of reviewers, and it seems sort of like Pearson too. They, they identify it as a potential crossover hit. And again, this is always the tricky thing with films that largely portray uh, LGBTQ characters. There's always a question of, can it cross over to mainstream audiences? Again, I think maybe that question gets asked in a different way now. Um, and I think it functions differently now, but certainly in the 90s. That was a question that still got asked, and it was asked about parting glances. It was asked about My Own Private Idaho as well, and it gets asked here, but there was a sense, again, this is part of a larger movement, but even within that movement, there was a sense that uh, portrayals of gay men had already sort of found maybe some level of acceptance, or at least were more prominent, and uh, Troche was sort of filling avoid as far as representations of gay women. So um, there, it was still early, you know, in that process, but a lot of reviewers felt like the, the, the comedic aspects, you know, uh, and the visually inventive style that Troche was sort of demonstrating might allow the film to reach a larger audience. But, you know, Pearson's claims that the film kind of got ghettoized at the same time. So, uh, but I think he kind of does it too, because throughout the chapter, he mentions, though, this is going to play great with a lesbian audience. Um, he seems to think that it can do more, but I think he's probably guilty of the very thing that he accuses a lot of reviewers of doing, which is maybe treating the film a little bit like a novelty, uh, maybe only viewing it as valuable because it's about an underrepresented group. Uh, so they kind of see it, again, as novel, as different, uh, new, fresh, exciting, but maybe not for all the right reasons because there's other things that are fresh and exciting. You know, again, visually, I think it has a lot going on. Um, but maybe he's saying that a lot of reviewers got hung up just on the lesbian character aspect of it. Not quite sure if that's what he means, but he also claims that, uh, you know, uh, Goldwyn, the studio, probably viewed it as a niche film and treated it as a niche film. Um, but again, I, it's, it's tough to navigate this because um, I, I don't think we should take it completely out of the niche either. In an interview uh, that she did sh shortly after the film debuted, Troche was quoted as saying that the film, com this, is, this, this is a quote here, coming from a, the film came from a lesbian space and essentially was intended largely for a lesbian audience. Her, another quote from her is that this is a nice film for lesbians not necessarily a nice film about lesbians. And that's an interesting idea that she's tapping into, kind of pushing back against the whole concept of crossover appeal, the whole idea that a gay filmmaker should sort of make her characterizations palatable for a straight audience or a more mainstream audience or whatever. Uh, she seems to be pushing back against that notion and arguing that, in fact, <laughs> she's not doing that. She's making a film really for a lesbian audience, an audience that, frankly, was not being targeted specifically by a lot of mainstream American films. So, um, you know, uh, just some stuff to chew on, think about. Uh, but yeah, upbeat tone, inventive visuals. Another thing that got written about and talked about at the time was the largely non-professional acting, <laughs> which some reviewers found fault with. Uh, and sort of criticized the film a little bit for some wooden acting, uh, some, some, uh, some performances that maybe were not stellar. I think the exception to that, though, really is uh, Guinevere Turner, who, like I said, really was a pro, although this was her first major role, I believe. But she would go on to do a lot of other stuff. And I would say she's arguably the star of the film as Max, uh, 
but she would later appear in a couple of films directed by Kevin Smith. So we're going to be uh, dealing with Smith soon and his film Clerks, which also came out in 94. Um, I believe, I'll have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure it did. But Smith uh, was a fan of Go Fish for what that's worth, for whatever it's worth. But he was very influenced by one scene in particular. We're going to get to that in a moment. But on the strength of just his uh, appreciation for the film, he uh, got to know Turner, actually, and cast her in a couple of his films, uh, Chasing Amy, which also has a lesbian character, and that's a big part of the plot. Very different perspective, I would say. But he cast Turner in that film, and then she would later appear in Dogma, another film by Smith. Uh, so she went on to have a pretty mainstream acting career, at least for a while. But she was also a writer. So like I said, she co-wrote this screenplay with Troche, and then she later co-wrote the screenplay uh, of American Psycho. The film version of the Brett Easton Ellis novel starring Christian Bale. Some of you might may have seen that. So she co-wrote that screenplay with Mary Heron, who also directed the film. And Heron just so happened to direct I Shot Andy Warhol, which was one of the films produced by Killer Films, that production company founded by Christine uh, Vachon, who also helped to produce Go Fish. And Vachon uh, again, a well-known independent producer who was known uh, for being interested in films that were depicting LGBTQ characters and themes. So, uh, you know, we kind of come back around to where we started. But, um, you know, Mary Heron would have been a candidate for this class because she's doing indie films like I Shot Andy Warhol uh, in the 90s. Uh, a woman director uh, at a time when there really weren't many uh, in the independent world or in the sort of mainstream Hollywood studio world. Um, but she's Canadian, for one thing, so I kind of disqualified her for that. Uh, but she does get a shout out here because she worked with uh, Turner later. So yeah, they co-wrote that screenplay, obviously adapting the Ellis novel. Um and later, Turner wrote the screenplay for the notorious Betty Page, which I'm pretty sure Heron also directed. So they sort of had a professional partnership. She wrote some other screenplays. Uh, she's also appeared here and there as an actor, although she doesn't really act, I don't think, a whole lot anymore. She was a writer for The L Word. Uh, an, a, a TV show that I think was on roughly a decade ago. Um, so she continued to work uh, acting and writing, but she achieved a little bit of pop culture recognition uh, in part due to this role and then her later roles in those Kevin Smith films. Um, and again, at the time, she was uh, uh, partners with Choche. So they had their own production company. They co-wrote this screenplay, and then Turner is the star. So I think she's got a lot of uh, charisma, a lot of magnetism. But yeah, the other actors, uh, <laughs> largely non-professionals. Um, but I think there are some interesting characters here. Uh, the character of Daria, I think, is uh, well played, well done. We also have the couple, Kia and Evie, I think they're the root. Yeah, they're the roommates of Max. Kia is a college professor, uh, so we see her in that early that opening scene where it almost see feels like we're in a classroom setting, uh, and we have her seemingly sort of teaching a class, maybe like a gender studies type class, um, and. I think Max might have been a former student, maybe even a current student. I hope not. That would be probably inappropriate to live together. But um, a former student. Uh, so they have an, a sort of a fun friendship. So it is kind of an ensemble piece. We have a lot of other characters that we spend time with. And also, obviously, uh, Eli. Um, uh so there's a high degree of realism when it comes to, I think, the interpersonal relationships and just the way the characters are presented, the way the characters talk, the dialogue, um, uh, sort of uh, 
a high degree of sort of realism, naturalism, again, sort of a slice of life showing us everyday life, maybe not a ton of earth shattering events, again, sort of how we framed parting glances a little bit, um, sort of mundane life to a certain extent, sitting around, talking, uh, doing normal things. Uh, but a lot of things are revealed in these apparently everyday mundane interactions. A lot of character development can take place. Um, and we also get this sort of elegant black and white uh, sort of uh, color scheme. And we get a camera that is moving, is vibrant, uh, gets us really close to characters. And we also have those breaks from the narrative action where we get a lot of imagery, a lot of uh, poetic elements sort of laid atop the everyday realism. So that's an effect that I think a lot of reviewers and viewers also responded well to. But yeah, we can see the small budget here, sort of limited locations, some stiff acting from these non-professionals, but uh, it's still kind of a fast-moving film uh, we get the, po uh, the, the poetic voiceover and those sort of extra narrative, outside the narrative moments that I want you guys to consider. And one of those moments, an example, I sort of alluded to it earlier, the scene where Daria is sort of interrogated and chastised uh, for sleeping with a man. So again, we sort of take a break from the regular action of the plot and we have this sort of extend, fairly extended scene where we have a lot of, uh, you know, sort of like a, a, an accusatory mob almost sort of confronts her. She sort of accosted violently and then they uh, sort of confront her with accusations and questions. But it's interesting to see that not everybody in the group is of the same mind. So some people are responding very negatively to what she's done. Others offer... Uh, sort of different perspectives. Nobody seems exactly thrilled by it, but some people are willing to sort of let her do whatever she wants, but maybe they just don't want to date her. Others have stronger opinions. And this kind of gets us into some of the issues about identity uh, that do get brought up in the film, even though the characters all seem pretty self-possessed, well-adjusted, like we've said. But that particular scene was very inspirational to Kevin Smith. And there's a similar scene that shows up in his 1997 film, Chasing Amy. And like I said, Turner has a, a small role in that film. And that film also kind of got celebrated for helping to, I guess, mainstream or normalize lesbian characters. But it's interesting to compare the two films. We're not watching Chasing Amy in here, but if you have seen it or, or if you get interested in Kevin Smith in a couple of weeks when we watch Clerks and you decide to seek it out, very interesting. Smith obviously being a hetero man, his perspective on lesbianism and his treatment of the lesbian character, I would say quite different. Uh, Joey Lauren Adams, who we saw in Dazed and Confused, plays the character in question and Chasing Amy, but, well, I won't give it away. I'll let you guys come to it on your own. But again, Chasing Amy was sort of lauded for a sort of frank portrayal of lesbianism and not treating it as something strange or othered or deviant as, again, uh, different kinds of sexual sexualities were often treated that way in previous decades. But Smith doing something different, but obviously influenced by this film and by that scene in particular. And like I said, he kind of sought out Turner after this film because he wanted to sort of collaborate with her. Uh, and they did. So again, like Parting Glances, maybe we can call this film sort of a witty uh, romantic comedy in a lot of ways if we want to assign, uh, assign it to a genre. A witty romantic comedy that just so happens uh, to be about gay characters, uh, which again is becoming more common and has become more common in the 2000s, but still somewhat novel in the first half of the 90s. And these characters are pretty comfortable uh, with themselves. Um, 
So we can definitely find links with parting glances, but maybe we can find some links with Stranger Than Paradise as well with the black and white, the urban setting. So Troche is from Chicago and this and this film was largely shot on location. It's set in Chicago. I don't know if they really uh, make it a point to specify a lot of Chicago specific locations or things, but uh, that was where she was based. Uh, so we're in another sort of urban setting. We have the black and white photography that might put us a little bit in mind of Jarmusch, but uh, we can also see some of Spike Lee's influence if we're thinking about the visual language here, the visual style of the film, much different uh, than that stationary camera that we saw with Jarmusch. So try to find some parallels with all of those films. But again, also keep in mind that this is another part of the new queer cinema of the early 90s, helping to make LGBTQ characters more visible, sort of answering uh, the call, sort of responding to the problem that's identified by, uh, by Kia in that opening scene about the fact that lesbians have often been invisible in literature, in film, and a lot of other cultural productions. So, and we can also think, again, about the humor and the visual style as maybe helping the film to break out of its niche, but at the same time, uh, in some ways, maybe it's meant to fill a niche to a certain extent, appealing to an audience that had not often been catered to and targeted, you know, in the past. But as and I think Pearson's tone towards Tro uh, Troche in the chapter at times veers a little bit towards patronizing, but he does seem to predict uh, that she's going to go on and sort of, uh, you know, do other things. I actually wanted to to read this quote. I don't know if I remember uh, what page this was on, but again, he doesn't elaborate very much. It comes near the end of the chapter. Yeah, on page 318, uh, he calls her a strong new voice. He says her name's been attached to several upcoming larger budget projects. Yet so far, she's in the limbo in which women directors get stuck too often. <laughs> and then he concludes that paragraph by basically, almost indirectly, I guess, claiming that if it hadn't been for him and Islet, the indie division of Island Pictures, his uh, indie branch, if it hadn't been for him coming along, she might still be sitting in Chicago with a half-finished movie. Um, so that's Pearson. He is a bit self-aggrandizing, but he doesn't elaborate on that trap or that limbo, that problem that women directors so often get stuck in. But I guess we can kind of assume that we know what that means. Um, but <laughs> I'm not entirely sure what it means, but just the fact that women directors just didn't get as many opportunities in the 90s and they were often sort of forced into particular genres or particular niches. And I guess that's certainly an issue that Troche faced. I just think considering her career a little bit is interesting on the heels of what Pearson kind of predicted. So she would go on to make a couple of other films, uh, Bedrooms and Hallways in 98, and then The Safety of Objects which was a pretty big budget production, came out in 2001, starring Glenn Close, uh, Dermot Maroney, a very young Kristen Stewart was in that movie. Um, but after those films, she kind of moved away from feature filmmaking. Uh, she worked as a producer on a few films, but she largely found work as a director for TV. I just thought that was kind of interesting. She directed episodes of several pretty well-known TV series, including Ugly, uh, Ugly Betty, uh, Vita, On Becoming a God in Central Florida with Kirsten Dunst, and the show FBI. I'm not familiar with that one. I think it comes on like ABC. It's one of those, you know, uh, 
crime procedural kind of shows, obviously, about the FBI. Uh, so she's directed episodes of all of those shows, but really hasn't done much in the way of feature films since the turn of the century. So, um, you know, she's an interesting figure. Her career maybe didn't take off the way it could have, the way it should have. And maybe we can think about some of the reasons why. But, uh, yeah, I was just going to see if I had anything else about uh, the the films, um, the how much money it made. Yeah, I think I've already covered it, but Pearson does say it made money at the box office initially, but I guess maybe didn't get a wide enough release or just didn't get marketed in a way that would make people continue to come. So uh, the box office proceeds kind of petered out, and then he says there wasn't enough of an, of a, of an effort made to push it on home video. So again, ghettoized by reviewers, he said, and also maybe not sold well by Goldwyn, uh, the studio that bought it, distributed it. So, uh, yeah, I'd like to hear what you guys have to say. And if you have any questions about the second critical response, just let me know. Next week, we'll start on Unit 3. We've already talked about Miramax a little bit. But as I was saying before, almost all of the films that we're watching beginning next week, all of the films we have left uh, beginning next week, with maybe one exception, uh, they're all coming from Miramax, either produced and distributed by, or at least distributed by Miramax. So we're going to talk more about that company, their very complicated legacy, and the sort of cultural impact of a lot of these films, which really did make a big impact uh, in the second, you know, from the mid all the way to the late 90s. So I'll see you next week, and let me know if you guys need anything, uh, or if you need any feedback or um, counseling on the next critical response.